Okay, this brings us to the final uh, hormone system we'll talk about today, which is the male sex hormone system. Um, this system, I think, is a little bit simpler than the female system, but it still has its nuances. So let's kind of go back to a very similar pattern we saw with the thyroid system, which is upstream regulation at the hypothalamus vis-a-vis -vis GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, that tells the pituitary to secrete LH and FSH. Again, if you just watched me go over the female system, you'll realize we have the exact same thing happening there. I just didn't draw all of this because we had so many other complicated things to talk about. So luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone are speaking to the testes. And yes, I realize as I drew this, I didn't need to draw two of them. That was a bit gratuitous. Uh, but nevertheless, the testes have different cells in them, uh, sirtuli cells and Leydig, Leydig cells. The testes make testosterone. Now, there's a little more complexity to this that I will come back to in a moment. But let's just start with the fact that the testes are making testosterone. We should also point out that testosterone is mostly bound. So just as I discussed with cortisol, most cortisol is bound, so is most testosterone. It's primarily bound to two hormones, sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG, and albumin. But a relatively small amount, and it depends on how much albumin and SHBG you have, remains free. So we call that free or unbound testosterone. And it's anywhere from 1% to 3% of the total testosterone. Now, there are two things that are siphoning testosterone away that are very important. The first is 5-alpha reductase, which is the same enzyme we talked about back when we were going over cortisol. It's siphoning off some of that testosterone uh, to make dihydrotestosterone. Now, not huge amounts, sort of, you know, a couple of percent, but dihydrotestosterone is a very important sex hormone. In fact, it has anywhere from 2 to 10, some studies would suggest even higher uh, potency, 2 to 10x potency for the androgen receptor than testosterone. So I'm going to talk about the androgen receptor in a minute, but I just want you to keep in mind that DHT has a much higher binding affinity for the androgen receptor than testosterone does. The other thing that is siphoning off testosterone is the aromatase enzymes that are converting testosterone into estradiol. Yes, that's the very same estrogen that women have as well. And estrogen turns out to be a very important hormone for men. I think this is something that hasn't been always appreciated, uh, but we now understand that, of course, estrogen is important in the male for mood, for body composition, for bone mineral density. So um, I'll talk about this in a moment, but things that suppress estrogen have to be considered judiciously because of the negative side effects of having low estrogen. Okay, not surprisingly, there is a feedback loop. So the feedback loop works uh, as follows. Testosterone levels as they rise will inhibit both the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which slows down GnRH and LH and FSH. This is actually much more complicated than I've drawn it here, and I realize that there's going to be some purist out there who says, oh my god, you forgot to mention this. Yeah, so it turns out that the hypothalamus does not have an overwhelming number of androgen receptors. So this is not happening directly, but rather indirectly. So testosterone is inhibiting a slightly different neuron that is then speaking to the hypothalamus. But I think for the purpose of this discussion, this is sufficient. The other thing to point out is that estrogen also inhibits luteinizing hormone secretion via the pituitary. So this becomes really important when we talk about uh, certain drugs that are used to replace testosterone or to increase testosterone. Okay, so let's just summarize what we've learned so far in the normal functioning system. GnRH tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH. They tell the testes to make testosterone. Small amounts of that are siphoned off to make DHT, and even smaller amounts, i.e. less than 1%, are siphoned off to make estrogen, and the system is in perfect balance. Now, how much of that testosterone is actually exerting its biologic effect on the androgen receptor? Well, it turns out very little is, because as I said, you have this thing over here, SHBG, plus albumin, and it's soaking up most of the testosterone so that really the free testosterone, which is the biologically active, represents only about 1% to 3% of total testosterone. But the good news is that's all you need. The stuff's pretty darn potent. So 
Testosterone binds to an androgen receptor. DHT also binds to an androgen receptor. It just does so in a way more potent fashion. And this happens inside the nucleus of a cell, and that's what affects transcription. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a subject that is way more complicated than I think it's being led, uh, than people are being led to believe it is, and that's testosterone replacement therapy. It's not as simple as looking at the total testosterone or even the free testosterone and determining if a person has low testosterone or low T. And the reason for that is when you are measuring total testosterone, you don't really know what the free T is. The free T is a calculated lab value. So they don't really measure free T by most lab assays. They measure to total testosterone, they measure SHBG and albumin, and they calculate free T. But let's assume that the calculation is fairly accurate. And even if you don't rely on a lab to do that calculation, there are calculators online that can do that for you. So let's say you now know the free T, and we'll talk about what some ranges are in a moment. The question becomes, is the patient's low level, because let's just say they're at the 30th percentile uh, for what their level is, does that explain their symptoms? Well, it's not entirely clear, because what we don't know is what's happening here. So we don't know how many androgen receptors a person has, and therefore we don't know how saturated their androgen receptors are with either testosterone or dihydrotestosterone. So we have to sometimes treat these things empirically, meaning we're treating symptoms, but we're using numbers as a guide to do so. So the most common symptoms of actual low testosterone, of androgen deficiency, in no particular order, because they're gonna vary significantly by men, would be low libido, erectile dysfunction, low mood, difficulty putting on muscle mass, and insulin resistance. Th those are the big ones that I see. Now, there are, there are others to be sure, but those are really the big ones. And we know from clinical trials that when you give a group of insulin-resistant men testosterone, their insulin resistance improves. We know that if you give men testosterone and you provide them with a training stimulus, muscle mass increases, strength increases, body composition improves, which means adipose tissue goes down. We know that mood improves. We know that a whole bunch of factors move in the right direction. But despite all of that, I'm still pretty cautious when giving testosterone because I think it is an overused hormone. I think too many people are being given testosterone and they probably don't need it because they're just being treated on their total testosterone level without necessarily considering these other factors such as free testosterone and of course without understanding these things which none of us can outside of a lab. So we have to really treat based on symptoms. Now what are the treatment options? Um, there are Broadly speaking, two ways to think about this. The first is a direct way to do it, which is giving testosterone. And this can be done in many formats. Uh, the most common formats would be topical testosterone or injectable testosterone, but there's also an intranasal formulation. There are pellets that can provide sort of a slow release over a period of months. And then there are indirect ways to give testosterone, which are basically tricks that mimic these hormones. So uh, the first of these is something called HCG, and HCG is a mimetic of luteinizing hormone. So an injection of HCG will tell the body to make testosterone just as you were giving luteinizing hormone. There is also a um, synthetic FSH. It's far more expensive and it's virtually never used. So the typical use case for synthetic FSH is in men who have been on testosterone replacement therapy for many years who have now lost the ability to make testosterone because if you are given enough exogenous testosterone, you will shut down the capacity to make testosterone in very short order. And within a year, two years, you will permanently lose that ability minus some Herculean doses of synthetic LH and synthetic FSH. So we should make sure we never lose sight of that. The other way to do this is to give a drug that has become very popular called Clomid. Clomid or Clomiphene is a drug that has been used historically by women using it for fertility purposes. Um, and what Clomid is doing is effectively tricking the brain via uh, 
stimulation of GnRH by blocking the estrogen receptor um, to make more LH and FSH. Now, the reason I'm not a fan of Clomid, there are several reasons, but one of the most important reasons is that it blocks the effect of estrogen in the brain. And that turns out to be a negative thing. Turns out we want the feedback of estrogen in the brain because it has many beneficial effects for mood. And there are some men who actually, when they're on Clomid, even though their testosterone levels soar, don't feel any better, we wonder if in fact that's because of Clomid. So not every man, there are some men that are on Clomid that feel great on it, but there are some who don't. Alternatively, you give testosterone, and when you give testosterone, you have to be mindful of the fact that your LH and FSH are going to go to zero because your body is going to stop making testosterone. This is a very potent feedback loop. When you give testosterone, these hormones will go up. Now they go up depending on a number of factors. 5-alpha reductase has quite a strong genetic component. So some men are very strong 5-alpha reductase producers, and they're going to make a lot of DHT. By the way, this is responsible for one of the side effects of testosterone, which is hair loss. So a lot of hair loss is driven by DHT and the androgen receptor, and therefore, if you're susceptible to that and you give, five, if you give testosterone and you make more DHT, you're going to accelerate hair loss. Similarly, aromatase activity varies genetically, but it also varies by factors such as insulin resistance, obesity, and factors like that. And therefore, the more adipose tissue you have, typically the more aromatase you have. So a person who's overweight is going to make more estradiol, all things equal from a given amount of testosterone, than a person who is lean. Are there side effects of having too much estradiol? Yes, there are. At some point, estradiol levels can become counterproductive. And of course, if they get very high, although I've never seen a case of this in 10 years of prescribing testosterone, um, we can see gynecomastia. So that's when a man will develop breast tissue. Again, these are typically things that are only seen in people who are using excessive amounts of testosterone, usually not under the care of a doctor, unfortunately. But if estradiol levels do get a little too high, they can be managed with a drug that blocks that conversion the drug is known as anastrozole. Again, I personally am not a big fan of using it because I find you really don't need to use it in most men. In fact, it's nice to have the estradiol levels go up because you want it for bone health, you want it for mood, you want it for all of those other reasons. So we will typically not use anastrozole unless the estradiol level is in excess of 50, 55, or even 60, unless we are seeing symptoms that we would attribute to that. My general philosophy on testosterone replacement is that there has to be a biochemical case for it, i.e. free testosterone needs to be relatively low, at least below the 50th percentile, and there needs to be, more importantly, a symptomatic case for it. If both of those conditions are met, and of course the patient understands the risks and benefits, we would give TRT for a period of eight to 12 weeks. We would determine that we've fixed the biochemical issue. So they go from being at say the 30th percentile to being at the 80th percentile. And then we assess the symptoms. And sometimes the man says, I don't feel any better. So you fix the number, but you haven't fixed the symptoms. And with very few exceptions, at that point I would say it doesn't make sense to continue this, we should stop doing it. Now, one exception to that would be if you were doing it for bone health. So if a man has osteopenia and he has low estradiol and low testosterone, we don't really care about symptoms at that point. We want his testosterone high, we want his estradiol high, because those are gonna be two of the most important steps we can take in combination with heavy training to increase or at minimum maintain his bone mineral density. But for most men, we care about the symptoms more than we care about the numbers. And if we don't fix the symptoms, we don't, we take it off and we also watch, hey, do your symptoms get worse when we remove the testosterone? Oftentimes they don't. And again, I can't answer what's going on there. I suspect that these might be men who have either low amounts of estrogen receptors or their estrogen receptors are just highly saturated with a little bit of testosterone that they have in the first place. All right, so there you have it. That's uh, sort of the quick overview of the male sex hormone system. Again, I think this system has its own nuances and complexities vis-a-vis -vis how to make the diagnosis and then, of course, how to treat it.